Okay. Uh, we would like to uh, give it a start and uh, welcome you with this uh, the first uh, lecture in this uh, the this year's series uh, of uh, of Humboldt lectures. Also on behalf of uh, the co-organizers, uh, Karl Martens, uh, who is not present yet, uh, but I assume that he will uh, be soon. Um, uh, maybe he got stuck in the traffic, <laughs> uh, but uh, well, that's the issue uh, for today, huh? mobility. Um, <coughs> and also uh, uh, Joris Schapendonk, who is also a co-organizer of, uh, of this whole series, focused on the cultures of uh, mobility. Of course, I would also like to uh, welcome our today's guest, Professor Peter Peters, uh, University of Maastricht, and also um, affiliated to the Professional University site um, uh, in Maastricht. At the University of Maastricht, uh, Professor Peters is um, affiliated with the Faculty of Arts and Culture. And um, according to his website, he has published on music, time and mobility. His research is concerned uh, with the debates on public prob problems related to mobility and the assessment of innovations that um, are suggested to solve these problems. Um, he has also conducted an, uh, numerous contract research projects on mobility related issues. Um, for the Dutch government, but also for the European Union. Uh, he is teaching social theory and uh, science and technology studies in the liberal arts curriculum and the European studies curriculum. Um, at the professional university, Zuid, uh, uh, in Maastricht, uh, he is lecturer for autonomy and public performance, if that's the correct uh, translation, of art. And as he explained to me, um, um, uh, some while ago, uh, on the one hand, uh, he focuses on the art of mobility, and on the other hand, he uh, focuses on the mobility of art. Um, and it's an honor uh, to have you here with us. Um, it's probably not a coincidence that um, we address this issue of uh, culture of mobility in uh, the framework of the Alexander von Humboldt lecture as it was uh, Alexander von Humboldt who probably was the first to teach us that geography is not just about different places at far and strange locations, uh, but especially also about the relationships and the interactions between those places. And it was not a coincidence that uh, he um, has become famous for his extended travels all over the world where he indeed related those different places with each other in a more systematic way. Also, you might say, um, enabling uh, <coughs> the globalized world we live in today. And what do we act actually mean with mobility um, uh, and the culture of mobility? Um, the geography of, um, of modern society uh, seems to be uh, constituted by different places and the interaction between these places. Movement of people, goods, money, information, ideas um, is an important uh, component of these uh, relationships. Um, and in our globalizing uh, society, the relationship between places all around the globe um, seem to grow uh, in importance. Um, as a result, uh, almost everything seems to be on the move. Uh, we live in a mobile world. But uh, what drives this process of ever-increasing mobility? And what effects does it have on our daily lives? And um, on the way uh, our society is organized? Traditionally, uh, in social sciences, uh, in general, but in human geography in particular, places were seen as rather fixed containers and uh, movements uh, were conceptualized as movements from one stable place to another. Uh, Karl, welcome. Yeah. 
It's about mobility. Huh? <laughs> um, okay, um, stability and uh, being at a particular place was seen as uh, uh, as normal, and uh, such um, sedentarism, as it's called, um, locates uh, bounded and authentic places or regions or nations as the fundamental basis of human identity and experience, and as the basic units uh, of uh, social research. Lately, uh, it is uh, sometimes assumed that in our globalized um, and postmodern times, uh, nothing is stable anymore, and we seem to live in a kind of a deterritorialized de world, uh, where everything is flowing and moving. And this is um, what could be denoted as a kind of a hyper mobility. Um, or characterized as a nomadist, a nomadist conception of our uh, current society. In this first uh, rather simplified sedentarist and mechanistic view, um, the only thing changing is the location or place of the people or things moving. What is often forgotten is um, the intricate uh, relationship between places, identities and movement. So what makes a place um, is to a large part determined uh, by what does not move and is seen as a permanent part of locality. But it's also uh, determined by what moves and changes. So issues of movement, of too little movement, or too much movement, or of wrong sorts of uh, at the wrong time, are central um, uh, to uh, to what we see as um, part of of, uh, of a place. Movement therefore makes uh, and breaks places and transforms modern society. Mobility, uh, the degree and kind of movement, therefore is uh, central to the structuration process and dynamics of our society. And that is much more than just the sec movement uh, from well-established stable places. Um, a to a place, uh, even the well-established place B. And it also involves much more than just uh, the technical infrastructure for um, uh, movement from A to B. Mobility is full of socially produced um, uh, meanings and uh, involves uh, a number of power relations. There is the distinction between the tourist and the vagabond, the scientist and the illegal migrant. It is about how our society is continuously constituted and changing. It is part of the cultural dynamics. Um, and as a consequence of these uh, social meanings and uh, cultural dynamics, mobility means more than movement across space. Or as Creswell formulates it in uh, geographical terms, movement is the dynamic uh, equivalent of location, while mobility is the dynamic equivalent of place. All the, uh, uh, at the other hand, also the alternative hypermobility view, where everything seems to be uh, on the move, and um, we can only think in terms of mobility, also somehow falls short um, and overlooks uh, the intricate relationship between mobility and immobility. It presupposes a utopian hypermobility in which nomadism is uh, romanticized. If every difference um, is dissolved in mobility and transformation, and if all differences are lost um, in uh, the um, indeterminacies uh, of um, a melting uh, modernity, uh, the actual engine and motivation for mobility, the, spatial, uh, the spatially differentiated uh, society 
is lost. And the concept of mobility itself is emptied of any meaning. At the same time, every global network of mobility is also dependent on um, uh, uh, and clearly identifiable, stable and reliable uh, global networks of mobility. Uh, nodes and, uh, and relay partners. Moreover, the emphasis on mobility overlooks the contemporary geopolitics of uh, immobilization. As it is often stated um, in the context of the European Union border regimes, the mobility of some might mean the immobili immobilization of others. So talking about mobility involves the cultural interaction between movement and stability about spatial structure and change, about um, identification and alienation. Uh, in this lecture series, we want to address um, the way in which both sedentary and uh, nomadic accounts um, of the social world operate. Um, and it questions how that context is itself mobilized or performed through the ongoing social technical practices. Um, this is also uh, the field in which Professor Peter Peters extensively did research. And he is probably best known for, uh, in, the, in this field for his uh, seminal book, The Haast van Albertine, which recently um, has been published in an updated version in English by, uh, by Routledge with the title Time, Innovation and Mobility. <coughs> So, let us not wait uh, any longer and give the floor to Professor Peter Peters with his lecture on travel time in technological culture. Uh, thank you, uh, Heb, for the uh, invitation to give this lecture. And uh, I think we are really looking forward to uh, an, an exciting series of presentations on this topic of mobility or mobilities that you have just uh, introduced and uh, which is a topic that has taken center stage in many interrelated disciplines in the past 10-15 years and as a cross-disciplinary field of mobility studies it's relatively new many authors have pointed out the fact that the multiple ways that people goods, ideas, images and information actually travel have been curiously under-researched in the social sciences. But this has changed radically. In the past five years, some 15 books were published with the word mobilities in the title. And the peer-reviewed journal Mobilities, published by Routledge, started its fifth volume uh, this year. And I must say the range of research subjects covered in this journal is amazing, from morning queues and parking problems in the metropolitan area of London, to the changing identities of migrants who traveled back to northern Sri Lanka after the ceasefire in 2002. The goal of my lecture is to give an introduction in this new and apparently booming field of mobility studies. And I will do so by focusing on an irony that, in my view, can help us to put the wide range of disciplinary approaches in focus. And this irony is that um, in the modern era we have strived for a zero friction society a society in which the time we spend on travel could be minimized and a society in which the art of travel has become a lost art as Daniel Boorstin has pointed out. Yet in doing so behind our back so to speak we have created worlds of meaning of control and of inequality and it is these worlds that have been ignored in the social sciences uh, until recently and also to maybe a lesser extent in human geography. The mobility 
of people, objects, capital and information across the world as one of the new and challenging research topics in what could be called the mobility turn. Academic interest in such mobilities has been more or less implicit in theories of modernization and globalization and recently however greater emphasis has been given to local processes of daily travel developments in transportation and communication infrastructures and also the cultures related to mobility I will discuss this emerging field by presenting three case studies in travel practices and I will present them as uh, ways of world making in other words what I'm trying to do in my lecture today is to give some evidence for a claim put forward by John Uri that the social sciences in which movement travel and mobility and that we uh, need a social science in which movement travel and mobility are seen as constitutive of economic social and political relations and it's interesting that when um, I talked about Tim Cresswell that you said that he uses the term uh, movement as the equivalent of uh, let's say location sort of abstract notion whereas mobility would then be the equivalent of place uh, more situated I think you can also add the word travel to that uh, travel has a different set of meanings than mobility it refers not just to a mobile dynamic state but travel is also a meaningful activity that has a cultural and social history it not, not only engenders a movement in abstract space and time but also assumes the subjectivity of experiences as well as the intersubjectivity of texts and discourses and as I'm going to argue in this this practice oriented approach travel cannot be reduced to getting from A to B as quickly and as smoothly as possible which is the underlying assumption in mainstream transportation research vocabularies on mobility so instead travel is treated as an integrated part of everyday life a normal practice so what I'm going to do in my lecture is, is recount how the social sciences reclaimed the lost world of travel. So first I will try to give some reasons why the journey has largely been ignored in social sciences. And then I will try to explain how focusing on the journey, on the practices of travel in its multiple forms could be transformative of social science as John Uri has claimed and in doing so I will refer to um, my own research on travel and mobilities I will not refer to my work on art which is a different subject um, and it's interesting for me at least that my own intellectual development uh, in a way is, is linked to the development of the field of mobility studies I think as a practice oriented approach to travel and mobility uh, we need an interdisciplinary perspective and in constructing my own perspective I have relied upon many theoretical and methodological insights from social theory, human geography and also constructivist science and technology studies so in social theory travel and mobility have been conceptualized and theorized extensively leading to concepts like flows, fluids, circulations and also mobilities but however in the older scholarship in the field these flows have remained as if black boxed and even more they are presented as explanations for processes of globalization rather than as phenomena that have to be explained in their own right and this is something you see for instance in the work of Manuel Castells Baumann, I hope you already mentioned him has identified mobility as a stratifying condition in a globalized world making a distinction between tourists and vagabonds 
But without explaining the various ways in which concrete practices of mobility include and exclude these tourists and vagabonds. And only recently the need for understanding mobilities in modern societies has been translated into research projects that focus on mobilities as an everyday practice and culture. And when we look to human geography, um, of course there is a lot of attention for um, time-space geography, starting with the seminal work of Hegestrand. Um, also, of course, time-space compression, uh, power geometries, uh, time-space compression term from Harvey, power geometries from Doreen Massey. But again here, without focusing on the actual travel practices that create this shrinking globe. And I think of seminal importance here, again, is the work of John Uri, uh, who started to write on tourist cultures in the early 1990s, and who was, of course, uh, you might say, the godfather of this whole uh, mobilities paradigm. I think also Nigel Thrift has to be mentioned here, who has written on almost every aspect of time-space practices. And I think, for my own perspective, and I've already mentioned that, what also was very important is the field of science and technology studies. And I find it interesting that um, a number of groundbreaking books and articles that have been written in this field have transportation as their subject. And we can think about the analysis of the modern bicycle by Pinch and Beiker, uh, Wiebe Beiker, who is a colleague of mine. And also early formulations of actual network theory uh, are focusing, for instance, on the building of light electric vehicles, an article by Calon. And there's of course the um, early article on actor network theory by John Law on the heterogeneous networks that enabled the Portuguese in the 15th and 16th century to navigate their sea vessels over long distances. And then again you can also mention Bruno Latour who wrote a wonderful book about uh, Aramis, uh, an unmanned Parisian metro that never made it from the drawing tables to the real world. So having sketched a bit the uh, sort of starting point of my lecture, I'm coming back to this irony that I started with. And also the question that is related to it, uh, how did the art of travel, the journey, so to speak, um, and by consequence also the interest in travel and social sciences. How did it got lost? In answering this question, what I'm going to do is first talk a bit about reasoning with travel time and space. And then I will say something about the passages of Thomas Cook. Uh, I wrote about that in my book. I will then rather briefly present three cases, case studies in world making as I've called that and I will end with some uh, remarks on researching mobilities. So since the early 1970s, the, uh, and this is also where my own work on mobility started, um, the continuing growth of mobility, especially car mobility, has been seen as an important public issue in the Netherlands. And it's actually the social dilemma of mobility that is still on the agenda. And the idea that what is good for the individual has to be weighed against the costs for society, as such as environmental degradation, uh, congestion, deteriorating quality of life in urban areas, the fragmentation of landscape, traffic uncertainty, all these problems have to be weighed against the individual benefits. And governments have tried to formulate policies to solve this social dilemma, but actually, in my view, without reaching a sustainable solution. So, when I started to think about mobility, this was in the context in the early 1990s of the question, how do we get people uh, from their cars into public transport? 
because that was, the, um, I think, a very important um, line of thinking at the time that uh, we needed a model shift, putting people uh, uh, as a, a, a way to uh, decrease the growth of car mobility. So that was actually one of the first articles that I wrote in 1990 in a, a magazine, it's called Intermediaire, and it had as a title in Dutch, Hoe bekeer je een automobilist? Or in English, how do you convert a car driver? So how do you get a car driver from his car, her car, into the train? The dominant answer, or maybe even line of reasoning in answering that question, and also one that underlies, uh, I think, a lot of the uh, policy proposals that have been put forward, um, is that they um, have been a politics of time gains. Building divided highways, ring roads, bypasses, constructing new railroads, tunnels, a new runway at Schiphol International Airport, also introducing road pricing, all these policies have as their ultimate legitimation the shortening of travel times. And however multifaceted the debate may be, this primacy of shorter, shorter travel times as a main goal in itself is not seen as an issue. And also conversely the loss of time as an effect for instance of traffic jams is really seen as an important topic in politics and policies. And so in political terms, travel time counts as the ultimate point of reference in judging the expected public support for a position and also the feasibility of proposed policy measures. Now this politics of time gains rests on two assumptions. The first is that time can be gained by speeding up transportation systems. And the second is that the societal costs and losses that result from this speeding up can be balanced by introducing new policy measures such as road pricing that we have been hearing a lot about recently again. At the time I started working on uh, uh, mobility politics, uh, as I said, the debate was dominated by an economic approach of travel demand. So economists and transport scientists could answer questions like why do people behave in traffic the way they do? Why does the car win out so often over public transportation if people are given a choice? What actually causes urban sprawl? Why are business travelers more in a hurry than tourists? And why does mobility, car mobility especially, increase every year? So to answer these questions, these e economists, economists produced elaborate models to analyze expected changes in travel demand and model shifts as a result of policy measures. And in these models, travel time was a crucial variable. The underlying theoretical approach assumes that people maximize their utility by making a rational choice between available options. And the argument is, of course, based on the idea that people's time is measurable and scarce. And since few people can do several things at once, they constantly have to choose which activities they are willing to spend their time on. So people travel from A to B because they can maximize utility at B. And the utility of travel time in these theories is a combination of the intrinsic utility of the journey uh, the pleasure do you derive from the act of traveling and uh, the derived utility that you get from arriving at your destination. And it is assumed that individuals experience maximum ut utility from the way they spend their time. Also very important, I think, is the idea that the marginal utility of travel time is negative. Utility can be maximized at B and not at A, and the more time it takes to get to B, the less time is left for the preferred activity. 
So the more utility that can be derived from this activity at B, the more people are willing to pay for shortening their travel times or, in other words, for travel speed. But given the fact that um, transportation has shown an increase in travel speed in the last century, why did the amount of time people spent on travel not uh, decrease? And here we get to an interesting hypothesis in the, uh, transportation science, the hypothesis of constant travel time, um, which is actually uh, showing that the time that people gain by traveling faster is lost in the increase of the number of kilometers they travel. So they travel faster, but the time spent on travel remains constant. And this also uh, uh, has been found in time budget studies. And the time spent on sleeping, working, personal care, recreation, and mobility has been more or less remained constant. Or as uh, Geert Hupkes, Geert Hupkes, uh, uh, Dutch transportation scientist who forward this uh, hypothesis of uh, constant travel time in 1977 said people do not really feel the need to shorten travel times nor do they want to reduce the number of journeys they make. So this leads to uh, an important conclusion speeding up transport doesn't save time but it actually increases the amount of kilometers uh, the distances that are being traveled. And in the, um, uh, the work of uh, Hupkus, uh, from this follows that if we really want to curb the negative effects of mobility, growth, then there is only one alternative, and that is a slower transportation system. So it's actually uh, reversing the argument. And of course this argument is only valid if there is a constant travel time. And there is a lot of work on establishing if there actually exists this constant travel time. But all these attempts, they are based on the comparative perspective that is based on a quantified concept of time. So different cultures, different social groups, historical periods have to be made equal in terms of the clock time they spend on travel. And this quantification, therefore, necessarily has to abstract from concrete practices of travel. And I think here again we can refer to Tim Craspel, one of the speakers in this series, who made the point that, and I've already mentioned that, the travel loses its meaning in this reduction of the journey to the span of time spent between A and B. And I would add that this also fits the irony that I started with. Because from the negative utility of travel time, the idea that you do not get any utility from the time you spend traveling, it makes sense to abolish the journey as much as possible. And yet paradoxically, the more we try to do so, the more we try to reduce the amount of time spent traveling, the more kilometers we seem to be traveling. So what I've done up to here was sort of reconstructing an economic style of reasoning and trying to find an explanation for the fact that we do not focus on uh, the journey or traveling uh, uh, as, a, as a subject. And I think this prevailing economic discourse on minimizing travel time can be linked to the discourses on the annihilations of space and time, or the shrinking world. Uh, these well-known common 19th century characterizations of the experience of mechanized travel. The idea that journeys that used to take hours or maybe even days now uh, took only hours. And we have this famous uh, slogan inscribed in New York's Central Station, Grand Central Station, had the steam train as the devourer of space and time. And I think um, for sociologists and human ge uh, geographers who have studied uh, modernity, this 19th century metaphors of a shrinking world are still um, uh, valid. 
in a way. They are still useful to historicize concepts like space and time. Uh, for instance, for explaining why modernization cannot be separated from acceleration. And Anthony Giddens, and this will be also well known, has um, uh, analyzed uh, time and also space as settings for social action. Um, and also try to historicize, for instance, the use of clock time. He makes clear that time and space are not givens and not sort of neutral containers of human action, but they are the condition for, but also the outcome of human actions. And he makes this important point in uh, uh, that uh, the extreme dynamism of modernity proceeds in three steps. It's first is the separation of time and space and also their recombination in forms which permit the precise time-space zoning of social life. Also the disembedding of social systems phenomena which closely connects to time-space separation and also the reflexive ordering and reordering of social relations in the light of continual inputs of knowledge. And I think the first is, of course, um, especially important. And the picture you see here um, illustrates the phenomena of time-space distanciation, uh, this separation of space and time that then can be uh, recombined in new ways. For instance, in the schedule of a railway company. And what you see here is a... Uh, an image of several generations taken from a book by Nigel Thrift. First, you see the great-grandfather traveling from his village to nearby villages, the second generation traveling to London, then to Europe, and then basically all over the world. And the son has the world as his oyster. So increasing travel speeds, I think, here, and also this time-space distanciation leads to a world that becomes bigger and bigger you might say. And it's interesting that in the work of David Harvey we found we find the exact opposite because he argues that um, the experience of time and space that used to be very much bounded with traditional agrarian cultural and religious orders has changed in the 17th and 18th century when we started to view uh, time and space as a sort of empty containers. And this Newtonian physics reinforced the notion of time and space as uh, abstract categories. Places were viewed as parts of space, more or less homogeneous, and as a result of new practices such as constructing networks of coordinates or maps, our whole notion of space and also of time changed. While Giddens treats the emergence of the clock time as an explanation of the dynamics of modernity, Harvey argues that it remains unknown why this dynamic has the character of an acceleration. And he refers to the Marxist dictum of the annihilation of space through time as a precondition for capitalist production. So the expansion of capitalist modernization leads to acceleration. And central to this process are technical developments such as transportation and communication. And this is what you see here in this very well-known picture taken from uh, the book by uh, Harvey. And where we have a world that is becoming increasingly smaller as travel speeds uh, increase. And in a way you could think of a sort of pinpoint world uh, just down there when we try to visualize the effect of, uh, for instance, the internet, the world that has become uh, a sort of point. And this, of course, is what um, uh, Harvey describes as this experience of time-space compression. Now, I think you can say that both Giddens and Harvey find the causes for the changes they describe, the changes that are characteristic of modernity. 
But these causes can be found in autonomous or quasi-autonomous technological developments. For Giddens, it's the invention of the mechanical clock or cartography, the land register, uh, register. and Harvey adds to these technological innovations in transportation and communications. And these technological determinist explanations, I think, are characteristic of many sociological and sociogeographical accounts of time and space. And so the acceleration of society, the changes in our experience of time and space, are an effect of te technological developments. And then you get all these accounts of transportation revolutions, for instance, by historians who see the development of transportation as a sort of logical sequence starting uh, with walking, the wheel, uh, maybe the steam train, electric train, zeppelins, and then finally the airplane as a sort of logical outcome. And again, it's always these technologies of transportation that are an important driving force behind social change. However, I think that also within this technological determinism, the journey as it is organized uh, vanishes from sight. Precisely because it is taken as a stable explanation uh, for these changes in time and space. And what I would suggest is that we try to take an actor's perspective and try to find out um, how our journeys are not, or our journeying is not the explanation for changes in time and space, but that it is actually the result of a complex interweaving of social, economic and technical relations. So then we come back to this uh, irony that I started with, where you can say that in economic discourses the journey vanished because travel times have to be shortened as much as possible. And where in this, let's say, geographic, sociological accounts, the journey vanishes as a result of this idea of the annihilation of space through time, how can we uh, reclaim it? So how can we bring back this lost art of travel? from the perspective of the many human and non-human actors that actually shape these travel practices. I think this point, uh, the point about the technological determinism, is also being made by Les and Uri in their book Economies of Science and Space, published in 1994 where they argue that the modern world is inconceivable without new forms of long-distance transportation and travel. But they also um, argue that um, insofar as commentators on the sociology of travel pay any attention to these new forms of travel, technological determinism is very present in their work. As if people almost naturally would choose the latest and therefore superior and therefore fastest means of travel technologies. But they claim that as important as these new transportation technologies have been, it is the organizational innovations which have, in certain cases, ensured that the new technologies have been economically successful and also culturally emblematic of the modern world. I think this is a very important point. So here they argue we shouldn't focus on the technology as an explanation for our ways of traveling, and we should go a step further. And in the case of the uh, chapter on Thomas Cook that Uri wrote in, in the book, it's all about the organization of travel. And in my own work I followed this uh, line of, of reasoning uh, focused on the work of Thomas Cook and Son, the company that started in 1841 when Thomas Cook tried to find a way to keep people from drinking too much because he was actually a teetotaler as it's called in English 
So he thought, what can I do to keep people from drinking too much? I can organize train excursions for that. So that was actually the start of the first excursion from uh, Leicester to uh, Loughborough. <coughs> and from that idea that you ha had to organize journeys for people, this whole uh, company uh, started. So he became a specialist in organizing travel arrangements. He mobilized what is called place myths. It's a term from Rob Shields. Uh, myths about specific places created out of stories and images which give people a reason to visit them. Because why would you want to travel by train to Scotland? Uh, it's raining a lot there. Well, one of the reasons could be that you have read the novels by Sir Walter Scott about Scotland which then becomes a good reason for you to go there. Personally, I also like very much the, uh, the Excursioner, which is a magazine that he published, featured a wide variety of advertisements, for instance, for temperance hotels, um, so hotels for people who didn't drink, also for steamship companies, and I also like very much the sort of handy travel equipment, such as the Bailey's air cushion, which reduces the effects of vibrations on the nervous system. I also like the Walters Railway convenience, which can be worn invisibly and with the greatest comfort and safety. Now, I have not a clue what this Walters Railway convenience actually is, but I would like to know. So what we learn from all these examples is that people actually had to learn how to travel by train and Thomas Cook was the one who taught them how to do so. And he was successful. He organized the journey of 156, 65,000 visitors to the Great Exhibition in 1851. He organized later on uh, journeys to uh, Pompeii. And there we already see uh, this notion of the hordes of Cook, where um, yeah, these organized tours caused considerable unrest among the London establishment, and, and they actually considered these people as, as vandals, mental patients is a term that is used. Um, he also organized uh, journeys to Egypt, sailing down the Nile, uh, made the agreements with the hotels and restaurants along the route. And there's also a very interesting anecdote um, that in Dijon, where the train to Egypt stopped for 10 minutes, a dinner of some eight or nine courses was served and well eaten. 10 minutes, nine courses. So Thomas Cook knew how to speed things up. And when in Egypt, uh, where he had a fleet of 20 Nile boats, he, um, he made sure that his clients were not really uh, confronted with the more unpleasant elements and effects of, uh, uh, of their destination. And so leaning over the railing of their Nile cruiser with an Egyptian cigarette in their hand, the British travelers looked out over the water as the locals, at the locals working along the shoreline. And even if Cook tried to protect his clients from these uh, unpleasant aspects of daily life, uh, this, many of them still experienced a culture shock. And then in 1872, Cook accomplished a journey around the world and uh, in doing so, felt that he had mastered and anticipated all the difficulties on the route. And from then on, he knew how to advise his clients as to time, expense, and accommodation of all kinds. And it's also very interesting to know that the novel by Jules Verne, The Journey Around the World in 80 Days, was actually inspired by a leaflet uh, about this Cook journey around the world that Jules Verne found somewhere on in a cafe in Paris. So to make the world smaller, eh, 
think back of this image of David Harvey. We didn't just need all these transportation technologies. We needed someone like Cook, Thomas Cook, who became an expert in organizing journeys. And to do so, he constructed what I've called passages. Um, and I've taken this idea of a passage also from an article by John Law. Again, I refer to it already when he describes uh, Portuguese sea journeys in the 15th century as products of negotiations between the heterogeneous elements in a network that enabled their oceanic transits. So sailing ships were part of that network, but also the wind and also the sea currents and also the king of Portugal's opinions. And they're all, it's through associating all these entities ranging from people through skills, artifacts and natural phenomena that what law calls um, an actor network is created um, by what he calls heterogeneous engineers. So I think you can see this construction of passages as Thomas Cook did as the ordering of heterogeneous entities in such a way that a situated relation between time and space is produced. And also in the case of Thomas Cook, you can see that these orderings were heterogeneous, relational and complex. They encompassed material elements like the train, signals, stations, tickets, baggage checks, hotels, steamers, but also immaterial elements such as these teetotaler ideals, the ideal not drinking too much, place myths and also colonial prejudices. I think not only do you have to create such a heterogeneous and relational ordering, you have to repair it because when traveling things sometimes go different. You make a plan but there are contingencies that must be repaired. And finally, also what you see in these passages of Cook is that they include and exclude people. Not only people, also places and moments in time. Because it's interesting, for instance, this journey around the world that Thomas Cook made. Actually, yeah, there was only one journey he, he, he could make because it was linking the main uh, harbor cities. Uh, and so traveling around the world could be done only in one way. So all sorts of places were actually excluded from this passage. And the same is true of uh, time. So after having introduced this notion of uh, passages as a way to uh, study the actual travel practices that uh, bring back the journey uh, inside, so to speak, I will now briefly um, go into three case studies in what I've called world making to show how the actual practices, the, way we, the ways we travel, the way we organize our journeys uh, are not just meant to get from A to B as quickly as possible, but are in all sorts of ways world making practices. <coughs> So the first uh, case that I want to say something about, and uh, this is also, I think, a very uh, important element in the work of Tim Creswell, is what you could call um, a world of meaning. So the question then becomes how meaning is produced in practices of travel. Because as he claims, Creswell, Movement is rarely just movement, it carries with it the burden of meaning and it is this meaning that jumps scales. The issue of meaning that remains absent from accounts of mobility in general and because it remains absent important connections are not made. Writing on mobility remains either very specific or maddeningly abstract, the kind of work that talks of points A and B. So how travel practices can be analyzed in terms of meaning uh, can be seen in uh, a story about the design of national parks in the United States. 
So what we see here is a car driver in 1902 who drove his Toledo to the edge of the Grand Canyon. And personally I like this picture very much because it shows this car driver in a sort of elevated position overlooking the Grand Canyon. And also he, it has the idea that he just drove there. Uh, he stepped in his car and he just drove to the edge of the Grand Canyon. And there is no road in sight, uh, nothing that in a way explains how he got there. And precisely this idea of no infrastructure is what changed radically in the United States in the first half of the 20th century. When the work that this car driver had to do to get to this place, maybe repairing his own tires and doing all sorts of things, this work was delegated to standardized networks of highways, gas stations, restaurants, motel chains, um, so in a way what you see is that car travel in the United States standardized in all sorts of ways. And this standardization can be seen as connecting the heterogeneous elements in multiple networks and this, these connections then render the flow, uh, this flow where car drivers could depend on. And of course this led to a huge increase in car travel and then for the national parks the problems became how can we adjust the parks in such a way that all these people visiting the national parks will not destroy the landscape that they're so eager to look at. In other words, how can we design the kind of intermediate landscapes that connect traveler and landscape? Because in the 1930s, when you went to these national parks, they were designed in a sort of rustic style Park villages, building park roads and trails, all embedded in the surrounding landscape. For instance, these park buildings were built using the material from the uh, surrounding landscape. Now, in the 1950s, there was a big problem because uh, the parks were sort of swamped by uh, travelers. A huge increase of visitors, all coming by car, and the problem became, how can we sort of adapt the parks to these new visitors and thereby also trying to solve this dilemma that is characteristic of the National Park Service on the one hand preserving the wilderness for future generations and at the same time opening up this wilderness for visitors. So in 1956 a project was launched, Mission 66, 10 years, also uh, uh, celebrating the 50th uh, uh, anniversary of the National Park Service, where um, the whole idea of a national park was sort of rethought. So uh, they built visitor centers, like it was sort of one-stop service units, um, and you could compare them to uh, supermarkets. Also the way they designed uh, the road through the parks uh, with using loop roads and spacious parking lots sort of resembles the urban uh, vocabulary of the time. And they uh, also made these uh, uh, specific viewpoints and I think this is a very nice picture if you compare it to the uh, picture of the car driver in his Toledo. Because here you see the kind of intermediate landscape that was uh, built in the 1950s as a way to connect the traveler, the passage, the American passage, to the wilderness that people wanted to look at. Um, and I think what this um, uh, example shows about the meaning of the place is that um, the Mission 66 program um, had to connect these two different worlds, uh, the world of the car and the world of the wilderness. And in doing so, there was a tension between material and discursive design elements. So in a way, these uh, roads through the parks were also designed as stories. And well known is the idea that when you go to a national park, you can go to a, a, a viewpoint and take a picture that many thousand people have taken before from the, exactly the same spot. Um, so in a way, by 
redesigning the travel through the parks, uh, the whole story of the wilderness had to be redesigned as well. What I personally also like very much is the tension between space and time in this process. Because one of the ways to circulate many people uh, in a short time through the parks is exactly by creating these loop roads, creating these easy viewpoints where people don't have to think how they connect with the wilderness, they simply have to get out of the car, take the picture and move on. And it was precisely by creating these loop roads that the increasing number of visitors could be handled in the parks. So, summarizing this case, mobilities um, yeah, create their own meanings or cannot be seen apart from meanings. A completely different world, yeah, you could say, is the world of control. Um, and I did some uh, ethnographic research in uh, the KLM Operations Control Center. This is a building at Schiphol Oost, or from where the whole worldwide network of KLM is uh, operated. And this is the place where I spent quite a lot of weeks. This is the sort of mission control of KLM. So when you travel with a KLM flight, you can be sure that people in this room are actually looking over uh, or watching over you. And so all the departments within the KLM are present here, the maintenance, the cabin crew. Um, and one person in this room, the senior operation controller, has the authority to uh, make decisions on the day of operations. And he's actually sitting, well, I can't show that, but he's behind one of those consoles. Now, why is this an interesting site to study? Uh, because, in a way, managing a worldwide fleet of airplanes is an extremely complex achievement. Because all these uh, events are tightly coupled, as Perot would say. If you want to have an airplane leaving airborne on time, you have to make sure that all sorts of processes sort of run parallel, are synchronized. And when one of the events that is part of the synchronized plan um, is, is not synchronized, it causes a disruption and a problem uh, occurs in real time and has also to be uh, solved in real time. Now, an example of such a problem uh, happened during my ethnographic research. And this is the actual screen that the senior operation controller is looking at in the mission control center. And in the left column, you can see all the airplanes of the KLM fleet. And you can see their uh, flights, if it's red they are in, uh, in maintenance, green is for inbound flights, yellow is for outbound, outbound flights. And the interesting thing is that the senior operations controller can click on, on, on these uh, yellow and green bars and get all the information about a specific flight. And then you see this blue dotted line, yeah, that is actually the now point, so that's where we are, now. And this also signifies this real-time aspect of what the people are doing there. It's on the day of operations, if a problem occurs, they have to solve it at that moment. And they do so, and that this happens, uh, for instance, when a plane in Barcelona was damaged by a luggage car, by shifting these bars, by taking a plane that is in maintenance, putting it in the place of the damaged plane in Barcelona. And the operations controller told me that is quite complicated and you cannot just use a plane that is scheduled for maintenance because postponing maintenance will lead to problems in a few days because the maintenance has to be done any anyway. So but in this case he could use the plane in maintenance uh, in such a way that there wouldn't be a problem later in the week. So what he then said that this plane was my exchange for today. I've now used it, and if another plane is damaged, my problem will be harder to solve. When he told this uh, to me, 
uh, I didn't notice the word exchange. It's only after I started typing the recordings and thinking about what the people were doing in the control center that I realized that this term exchange is very important. Because it's precisely having this exchange, in the case of the Barcelona problem, um, a plane in maintenance, that enables you to solve problems in real time. It's actually the way that the people in the control center run this whole operation, is by exchanging money, capacity in the form of spare planes, information, knowledge and experience, authority, and also risk. Although risk uh, was not seen as an exchange by the people of KLM, um, I think in actual fact risk is a kind of exchange though. What I uh, find inter interesting about this site is that what is being done in the operations control center is actually creating a virtual situation. It's by bringing in the information from all sides information on the state of the fleet is that a sort of overview of the whole system is being created. And it's precisely by exchanging elements within this virtual situation that you're able to solve problems in real time. And I think this notion of exchange also returns in the work of Vincent Kaufmann and also John Uri. Uh, they both analyze the need for what they call network capital, a term loosely related to Bourdieu's forms of capital. And it refers to the options and conditions that determine the access to possible mobilities. And now the metaphor that is used there is the uh, concept of motility that encompasses interdependent elements relating to access to different forms and degrees of mobility. I think the operations control center is a good metaphor for the kind of work that we all have to do when we want to shape our social life through being mobile. In a way we all act like an air airline company. We constantly have to juggle between plan and reality. We constantly have to allocate the necessary means to travel and we have to react to unforeseen circumstances by employing the network capital that we have at hand at a specific moment. And I think the OCC, the Operations Control Center, explains the popularity of mobile devices such as the iPhone, because they provide us with the kind of real-time information that enables us to create an overview that helps us to anticipate and solve problems. So analyzing the way people use network capital helps to understand how people control and orchestrate their daily lives through controlling and managing their activity patterns. Then, briefly, my last um, case study, and this is on a completely different subject again, and now I think I'm focusing on the kind of worlds of inequality that are produced, that are made through our practice of travel. And I think this perspective on mobility, the perspective of inequality, is also one that is taken by Guy Baten, who is one of the speakers in the series, and where he focuses on processes that empower and disempower certain groups. And of course this whole notion that mobility is unevenly distributed in society. And this is crucial for understanding the socially differentiated nature of mobility and also for understanding how mobility is crucial to the patterns of contemporary social inequalities. One of the things that I uh, encountered in the, the, the 90s when I thought about how to get people from the car into other forms of transport was the work that was being done on the bicycle very important, uh, typically Dutch, means of transportation. And in the 1990s, the central government did a lot of work on promoting the use of bicycles. They even had a bicycle master plan. And this was aimed at reconstructing the traffic landscape in such a way that traveling uh, using a bicycle would become uh, easier and therefore more 
popular. So in a way, this whole process of redesigning uh, infrastructures for the bike can be seen as a kind of micro-politics at street level. Micro-politics that, in a way, are a translation of the macro-politics of the policy go goals of the various governments. So creating this cycle-friendly infrastructure, um, I think, is a very interesting case to study the political and normative uh, dimensions of travel practices. So how do we discuss these politics of passages? Well, one of the ways is by looking how um, this designing for the bike actually turned out. And what's striking is that in the end um, um, they ended up with a very technocratic perspective. They ended up with the idea that you could design a landscape in such a way, a traffic landscape, in such a way that you could fine-tune form, function, and use. And you could, um, in a way, solve the coexistence of different uh, speeds by uh, fine-tuning. Because that is, I think, a very interesting aspect of the kind of daily traffic landscapes that we all know from our experience. Uh, one example you see here, it's uh, in Drachten, in the north of the Netherlands. And you see all sorts of elements that are used to coordinate the coexistence of cars, pedestrians and cyclists. So a lot of what uh, is going on here has to do with the delegation of um, um, the act of traveling away to, uh, to the landscape. So when you're in a car, you know you have to stop for a red light and you don't have to think. And if you are seeing this uh, pedestrian uh, crossing, you know you will have to stop there if somebody wants to cross. Uh, and so this uh, infrastructure uh, co um, helps to uh, have these different speeds coexist by um, coding the landscape in a specific way. Now here you see the same uh, situation after it had been redesigned through the ideas of Hans Monderman. Uh, he recently died. He was one of the um, uh, great minds behind what is called shared space. And his idea was quite simple. He said, well, we don't have to sort of delegate this attention of people to the traffic landscape. Instead, we have to de design it in such a way that they have to stop. And this gives them time to assess the situation themselves, to negotiate what's going on with their other traffic participants, and in a way, this creates a completely different world, a much uh, slower world in his view, and also a much safer world. And I think this, these two pictures are a very nice example of how we can consider this intersection of multiple speeds also as a kind of two different interfaces between various worlds. Uh, the worlds of the car driver and the cyclist, for instance. Now, what makes these designs political? I think they are political and that normally we don't have a choice. Normally, we design the traffic landscape according to the first picture. And it's only by designing it according to the second design principle that we have a choice. And it's by creating this choice between two design principles that result in two different worlds that we give back a sort of political element to the design of the traffic landscape. So a good traffic design excavates the inherent political dimension that is present in the coexistence of passages. And as such it makes these choices explicit rather than just making them in a te technocratic way. <coughs> so
So what we see here, two design styles. The first, you could say, is a modern design style where the problem of intersecting speed is dealt by preventing their intersection. For instance, by using uh, traffic lights, uh, which can be seen as a sort of uh, crossing a uh, viaduct uh, and over uh, in, in time. But it in a way leads to what you could say the rights of the fastest as, uh, as most prominent. Whereas an organic design style seeks to integrate traffic participants, uh, slowing them down, giving them the opportunity to communicate and therefore uh, you could say sharing the road. And as I said, each style creates its own world and it's in the choice between these worlds that we can find the normative political aspect of uh, traveling. I want to close by um, giving some thoughts on researching mobilities. Uh, the art of travel the whole notion of travel as an art evokes a profoundly romantic vision of travel. And travel is very often also taken as a metaphor for life itself. I've done some research on romantic walking in the early 19th century. And in those days people liked to walk just for the sake of walking not to reach a destination, but just for walking. And they also were delighted to look back on the path that they had created in traveling by foot. So traveling itself was the reason they got on the way. It was an art for its own sake. And the act of walking also provided them with new means of being reflective. While walking, one would become a better thinker. We could come easily to the conclusion that modern mobilities leave little room for reflection of the kind that early 19th century walkers cherished. So successfully have the problems for travelers been solved that the act of travel has become almost automatic. And as I've tried to argue within, um, uh, let's say, in, in economist uh, vocabulary and also within some of the uh, sociological and geographic discourses the act of travel vanishes from sight. Travel seems to be lost. I think it's by putting travel practices at the forefront of the analysis uh, in the way I've done in my three case studies but also in the numerous articles and books that are published at the moment. It's in this analysis that we can reclaim the many lost worlds of travel. <coughs> it makes it possible to get around the deterministic assumptions which underpin most mainstream transport research. I think instead understanding mobility dilemmas as design problems implies that there is not just one best solution but there is many, many design styles, for instance. So I think um, reflecting on the transformation of travel in te technological cultures, a reflection that goes beyond the dualisms between measured travel time and experienced travel time, between travel as a goal in itself and as a means of reaching a destination, or the dualism between slowness and speed. It's in analyzing contemporary travel practices that we can escape these dualisms. That we can find much more precise means of examining how and where, and where practice of, uh, practices of travel changed. Because that is my, uh, my argument, that any journey, however planned and pre-structured it may be, will entail uncertainties and ways to overcome them. And this is true for the journey on foot that the people in the early 19th century made, but also the journeys that uh, KLM travelers make. What has changed are the means of reducing the uncertainties, 
the ability to construct new types of passages and to synchronize them over greater distances. And what also changed are the strategies to justify and maintain them in a political and normative sense. Concepts such as network capital, motility, passages and many others that are currently being developed in the mobilities field create a research framework that helps us to study how people travel, how they solve problems on their way and how some of these problems can be solved beforehand. And so instead of the, uh, let's say, discourse of an end of travel, sometimes in the form of a double-click instant journey on the internet, I think we should uh, go back to the Ars Apodemica, the art of travel, and try to study this art of travel and see how through the ways we travel we create all sorts of worlds. And I think this claim is central to many of the uh, authors in the field of mobilities, also to the people who will uh, speak after me. And um, it's precisely by studying the mobilities that constitute our daily lives that we can learn more about the world we live in. And that's precisely what this paradigm of mobilities sets out to do. Thank you.